are listening to the Classic Sermons Podcast from PreachTheBible.org, a ministry of North Valley Baptist Church in Santa Clara, California. You will hear fervent, old-fashioned revival sermons from great preachers of the past. It is our desire that you will be helped by this gospel message. The scripture said in verse 3, And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commandeth us uh, that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? Now notice verse 6. This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Look this way before I read the next verse, please. Three times in the Bible, the finger of God wrote. In Exodus chapter 20, the finger of God wrote the perfect law of God. And brother, that law is perfect. In Daniel chapter 5, you have the penalty for breaking that law when the finger wrote on the wall. In John chapter 8, you have the pardon for a broken law. So you have the perfect law, the penalty, and then the pardon, all written by the finger of God. In each case, the finger of God wrote these things. Now let's look at the next verse, please. The Bible says, So when they continued asking him, he lifted him up, up himself and said unto them, He that's without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Now, we better be careful how we're throwing rocks. If you live in a glass house, you better not have too many rock fights. Amen? Better be careful about that. And Jesus said, if you're here and you don't have any sin, and if you're all right, said, then cast a stone at her. And again, notice the second time he stooped down, and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone. Now the woman standing in the midst, and when Jesus had lifted up himself, saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Have no man condemned thee? I notice her answer. I love this. She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. He said, It's going to be different now, lady. That's going to be different, woman. That I want you to know that I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to give you life. I'm here to save you. I'm here to uh, make you justified before a holy God. You can leave. And when you leave, go to sin no more. Neither do I condemn thee. Would you be seated all the house, beloved? Everyone seated, every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to pray. And in just a few seconds, I'm going to bring the message. Father, I thank you tonight for every blessing to be able to come in the house of God. Oh, we thank you for your presence and your power. I'm glad, Lord, you've already spoken to us. I thank you for the good singing. I'm glad that our God came. He didn't send someone. He came. Went out on the great shores of eternal damnation and reached down and picked us up out of the very jaws of death. I'm glad found us yonder sheep that were astray, brought us back to the fold. And I thank you tonight, our Father, that one of these days we're going to step on the cloud. Thank God we're going to say goodbye to this old world. I'm glad the rapture's soon to come. And I'm looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I pray that you'd bless us now the preaching of the Word of God. Lord, you know that woman that's nearest to eternity without you. You know that young person God that squandered his life uh, and passed God up thus far in life. Uh, oh, God, you know that one tonight uh, that had no time for God, no thought of eternity. I pray that the blessed Spirit of God shall speak to that one. Uh, and may this be the night of salvation. Uh, may this be the night of consecration and dedication. Uh, oh, God, may this be the night uh, when we'll draw nigh unto thee. And all you do, uh, we'll praise you because we ask it in Jesus' name. Uh, Amen and amen. Beloved, I want us 
become the sweetest words Jesus ever spoke. I want to say to you, it's blessed. The reaper, he said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. I know that if I said it dogmatically, somebody would say, Brother May, the sweetest words to me are where you read in the Bible, come unto me, all you believer. Others could say, for God so loved the world. Others would say, let not your heart be troubled. And there might be a difference, but to my heart tonight, I'm glad. Praise God that I heard him say, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. I want you to see something by way of introduction. Here Jesus was teaching in the temple yard. And the multitude had gathered. What an unusual scene. And they come a crowd with a woman. They dragged that poor old woman up with blood on one cheek. And possibly mud on the other cheek. And they poured down at Jesus' feet. And they stand there. And this woman, no doubt, in fear and frustration. Prayed to look up. I want to tell you, brother, when you get in the presence of divinity, you'll be afraid. And I see in this story, by way of introduction, three things. If you want to write them down. First of all, I see a condemned woman. Here she was, caught in the very act. She couldn't deny it. She was condemned already. I want you to know tonight, the book says, He that believeth not is condemned already. You don't have to rob a bank. You don't have to be caught in the act of adultery. The book says, if you have not believed, you're condemned already. So we have a condemned woman. Secondly, we have a compassionate Savior. Aren't you glad that there's one that has compassion upon those that need the compassion of the Lord? Now I tell you, sometimes I'm too harsh, and sometimes I may not be harsh enough. I believe if there's anybody that ought to be preached too hard, it's this old gang of Pharisees and scribes and hypocrites that are twofold children of hell. And I believe we ought to be hard on them, but many times we out here hard on an old drunk that's in the gutter, a poor old fallen woman, and we have no compassion. But brother, when Jesus looked at this woman, he had compassion upon her. Not only we see a condemned woman and a compassionate Savior, but we see a crowd that had no answer for the one that has all the answers. Brother, they went away with their conscience straight, and they went away one by one. And Jesus looked at her and said, Woman, where are the accusers? And she said, Lord, there's not a man that condemneth me. And then she said, looking unto him, I, I can hear say, what are you going to say, Lord? And he says, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. I'm going to give you six things tonight. If you have your pencils, they start with this. On the authority that Jesus had. When he said, neither do I condemn thee. You say, how could he say that? First of all, he said, he's the law for her. I'm glad, praise God. They satisfied the law for me. I hear somebody say, Preacher, don't you live by the law? No, sir, I'm under grace. Hallelujah. And what a blessing it is to know that. But you say, Preacher, I'm glad that Jesus satisfied the law for me. And Jesus satisfied the law for you. He came not to destroy it, but he came to fulfill it. Listen to what the book says. Colossians 2.14 says that the law was nailed to his cross. Romans chapter 10 and verse 4 says that he, Christ, is the end of the law for righteousness unto all those that believe. That's talking about me. I'm glad, praise the Lord. He satisfied that law. He never took a step outside of the law. He walked in perfection. And thank God he satisfied the law for every one of us that we believe. A lawyer in Matthew 22 came and he said, which is the greatest commandment? You know, you talk about people saying, I keep the law. Let's see if you can keep the first two commandments. He said, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, the first one's like this. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy soul, mind, and body. He said, I can't do it. Listen to me. I say tonight, I can't do it. I'd like to love God with all my heart. I wish I could 
love God with all of my soul. I would that I could love God with all of my mind. That I can't. And then the second one, he says, like unto the first, that you shall love thy neighbor as thyself. And certainly I fall short there. Therefore, James 2.10 says, if we offend the law in one point, we're guilty of the whole law. So I've got to find some way or somebody that can satisfy the law for me. And praise God, I'm glad that the Lord Jesus Christ satisfied that law for me. Some of you don't remember those days of the Depression, but I remember them very well. And I'm going to give you an illustration quickly about how that he bounced the scales and about how that Jesus satisfied the law for me. We used to have a man drove up to the drive up to our home and a little pickup truck called the Raleigh Man. And he'd toot his little horn and my mother would go out and he'd say, Miss Jackson, I know you, you need some vanilla. Yes, uh, I, I know you need some, probably some of this here. That's uh, salt and some of that seasoning. My mother would say yes. Uh, then he'd say, I got some of the best liver pudding that you've ever seen in your life. Now, some of you've never had any old-fashioned mountain liver pudding. You don't know what's good. Did you know that? But he had a big, a great big helmet over here of, of liver pudding. And then he took out a little pair of scales. Uh, and he put those scales up there in his, the back of his truck. He'd say, Mr. Jackson, how much liver pudding are you going to want? And he'd say, I'll take a couple of pounds, sir. He'd reach down. Uh, and take that old goblet and reach down there and take out some of that liver pudding and put over here on this side of the scales. Then you'd put a two-pound weight on this side. And you know what had happened? Oh, listen, it wouldn't balance until you'd reach down and get a little more pudding. After a while, when the liver pudding got to the place where the, that two-pound weight may have balanced like that, he'd reach over and say, I got you two pounds of the best liver pudding you've ever tasted. But 1,900 years ago, I was lost and condemned that a law breaker. Now I got upon the scale, so to speak. Over here on one side was God's law, God's holiness and God's requirements. And I stepped up in the scales, and they wouldn't balance. And I tried to get them to balance. And I tried to get them to balance. I joined the church, and I stopped smoking and stopped cutting a while. And the scales wouldn't balance. And I was about ready to give up. But that night, I never will forget. I was by myself. And I was lonely. And the law had been broken. I needed somebody to satisfy the law for me. And a knock came to my heart. And Jesus said, what's the matter, Maze? I said, the scales are unbalanced. The law's a broken law. And I can't balance the scales. He said, would you like for me to balance them with you? I said, yes, sir. He said, get back up in the scales. I got back up there, but the law of God and the holiness of God and the righteousness of God and the law of God would not balance. About that time, he said, me, he said, are you sure that you want the scales balanced? I said, yes, sir. He said, make room for me in your heart. And brother, when he stepped up, brother Dennis, I'm glad for the first time in my life I heard him singing justified. The scales balance, praise God. I'm glad that Jesus Christ had the authority because he satisfied the laws of God. Number two, he had the authority because Jesus gave us strength in our weakness. Now here you say, preacher, I can do it all. No, you can't. Not without him you can't. He said, without me you can do nothing. Romans 5, 6 says, For we were without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. Yea, in due time, when I was without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. There was a time I wanted to go to him, I couldn't. Had no strength, but I'm glad, glory to God, in my strength, weakness, his strength is made perfect. Let me give you an illustration about this quickly. In John chapter 5, the Bible said there's a sheep gate and a pool, and by that pool were many poor if of some people blind and fall can lean. But once a year, an angel came down and stirred the waters. Now, you know, I like to be around when the waters are stirred. Now, praise God, I like to be around when God stirs the waters. Now, I know a lot of people, they won't ever think quiet. I hope it gets a while around here. We'll like take you back before this thing happens. And somebody said, preacher, I work for the waters to be stirred. And what a blessing it is to be around when God stirs the waters. And when God begins to move. And when God begins to stir. One old fellow there, 38, boys right there. 
He said, hey. Jesus said, what can I do? He said, you know, I don't have enough strength. I've been wanting to get to them water so bad. I don't have the strength to get there. And before I can get to the waters every time, somebody comes in front of me, picks up somebody else and takes them to the waters. He said, I don't have enough strength to get there. And then Jesus said, Arise, take up your bed and walk. I'm the one that stirs the waters. Praise God, you can get up. I'll give you strength. And brother, he took up his bed. And thank God he walked, mister. I'm glad Jesus said, Neither do I condemn thee. Because he satisfied the law. He strengthened me. Number three, I'm glad he said, uh, Neither do I condemn thee. Because he slipped a robe of righteousness around me. Glory to God. It wasn't mine. It was the best robe that Calvary had. Woo! Praise God. I'm glad tonight. I'm not doing what Isaiah said. Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6 says, For oh, your righteousness is filthy right. We're all it's an unclean thing. There was a time I wore an old filthy, dirty coat like this of my own Baptist leadership. My own goodness and God looked down and said there's nothing but rags there. But in Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 10, listen to what it said. It said, For he had placed on me the garment of salvation. Glory to God. The Bible says when the prodigal came home, he put the best of Oh, morning. I'm glad Mr. God can take your old rags and give you a robe of righteousness which is spotless tonight. It's been made white and it's been made right in the blood of the Lamb. Thank God. What a blessing it is to know he set that robe around you. I used to do the prodigal son a lot in my meetings. And I'd have somebody go out and act the part of the prodigal and then he'd come back ragged Singing, I wanted far away from God. We flew this with old Dad Spear. I remember one time was working with Dad Spear and the Spear family years ago, and I wouldn't work with them now. The hair's too long. Say amen there. Amen. They look too much like hunting dogs or something bushy. But uh, old Dad loved God, and I want to tell you something. Dad Spear loved God. G.T. Spear is what his name was. You know what he used to do just like he would tell me, he said, Brother May. He said, if all Baptists is like you, I believe I'd be a Baptist. I said, well, if all Nazarenes like you, I might join in and say amen right there. I said, bless God. I'll tell you, I like that clean living. I like that. Boy, you say, he believed in being sanctified. Some of you'd be better off. You'd get more sanctified. Amen. Father, we ought to have as clean when it meets the word holiness. God's holy. The Bible's holy. God's church is a holy people. And we'd better go back preaching the holiness of God in these days. In which we live. But old Dad Spear was a good one. And one time I told him up there at Athens, my wife here tonight, she remembers that. And, well, I guess we had 1,500, 2,000 people in that big tent that night. And old Ben was the one going to play the part of the prodigal. I worked with him all afternoon. I said, now, Ben, when I get you up there and you go out to the bus, and I said, get that old work, get some old fishing clothes on rags. And I said, we'll have Mark Spear and GT Spear, your dad, up there. And I said, you come back with that old uh, stick across your shoulders. And I said, have your head bowed low, singing, Lord, I was far away from God, now I'm coming home. And I said, your dad will be up there. And I said, I- I'll look over him, and then he'll look at you, and uh, then he'll look at you again. And then I said, you keep coming closer. And then I said, finally, he'll jump up, and he'll run back and put his arms around you and say, this is my boy, which is lost, but he's fine. This is my son that was dead, but I'll have again. And I said, he'll bring you up here and put a nice robe on your back. And that night we had that thing filled, and I was pushing away. And old Ben came in. He's so sad. He got, he got me to cry. And I got to cry, and I, 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 I kept waiting for Dad. And I looked over, and old Dad is going, and I said, hurry, Dad, get up, get up. And I was just preaching away, and I said, Dad? And he looked up, and he said, get up yourself, bless God. I'm having too good a time. I mean, he just got down and had him a time. But brother, when he finally did get up, you won't believe this, but I'm telling you the truth. When he ran back and grabbed old Ben and put that robe on him, 300 people were shouting. I beg your pardon, 301. I was in that last bunch. Praise God. You talk about a time, brother. We was having a time and somebody said, Maze, I want you to know that I came to him ragged and he put a robe upon me. I'm glad he slipped a robe of righteousness. You say, what authority 
He brought a robe that you might be righteous. He put a robe of righteousness upon you. Let's hurry on tonight. You say, what authority? Jesus uh, stepped out of the grave for me. Uh, Romans 4, 25 says, and he was raised for our justification. I like what J. Wilbur Chapman wrote when he wrote that immortal hymn. One day, listen at the chorus, living he loved me, dying he saved me, rising he justified, freely forever. And someday he's coming. Oh, glorious day. I'm glad when Jesus got up that first Easter and said, I'm he that was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. Brother, he was raised for my justification. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And because he lives, praise the Lord, I'm glad I live forever. I don't serve a dead Christ. The tomb is empty now. The stone is rolled away. I had a good friend and Jerusalem and I saw him many years a couple of things he did I didn't like one he'd run up and kiss you I don't believe men ought to be kissing on men say amen right there and I don't believe you ought to be kissing on anybody but your wife anyway say amen right there I believe that the second thing you do as soon as you came to his house he'd give you wine I mean just every time he'd say now brother May you're fanatical I'd say maybe but I want to tell you something, I quit drinking wine, liquor, and beer. When God saved me, I became a teetotaler, brother. Amen! I said, I don't even like to smell it anymore. I said, I believe you ought to be so dry the cow to go dry. Say amen right there. I told him, I said, I can't. He said, now, Brother Mays, over here, he said, we take what Paul said. Take a little wine for the stomach's sake. I said, the name's not Paul. My tummy don't ache, so I'm not going to take it. Bless God. And let me say this to you here tonight. But he was a wonderful man. And he told me for 18 years, he kept the garden tomb. And he said, Brother Mays, you know what I've done for 18 years right here in my little house? I said, no, Solomon. And what have you done? He said, before I brush my teeth, before I wash my face, before I comb my hair, before I read my Bible, before I do anything. He said, I walk here to this window, look at the, the mouth of that tomb, raise my hand toward heaven, and say, pray God, he not near, he risen. Said, every morning when I get up, I come out here and say, praise God, he's not here, he's risen. And you know what happened to him during the six-day war? On the third day, he and his wife and a little German secretary was in the tomb. And Solomon said, I've got to go to the house and I've got to get some uh, something for to eat. And his wife said, Solomon, every time that little bell is, uh, every time they ring that little bell, you've gone there. He said, you've gone for the mighty and you've gone for the lowly. And said, if it rings today, don't open it. And Solomon said, honey, if it rings today, I'll open it. Uh, the bell rang while he was getting the vittles up. And he put down the little uh, basket and went over and opened the door. When he opened the door, back to the garden tomb. It's an old wooden door. He said, praise God, he's not here, he's risen. And they mowed him down and shot him, uh, shot him half in two. And after they left, Miss Matter got out of the tomb and dragged him over to the mouth of the tomb. And when she got to New York, she called and she said, Brother Mays, I want to tell you and Brother Sturgill something. I'm glad I caught you there with Brother Sturgill. She said, you know, the last thing that my husband told those soldiers, for they shot him. Thank God he's not here. He's risen. Said the next second he was with Jesus. Said the first thing he said to Jesus, Jesus, I just told him you wouldn't dead. You was alive down there just now. I want to say to you, praise the Lord. I'm glad that he was raised for our justification. The tomb has been empty now for 1900 years. Death could not hold him. Oh, Satan could not keep him there. I'm glad he got yeah. I never will forget. Years ago, when I went over the first time now, I've been 15 times. My wife said, I've been 17 times. I don't know. So if your wife's around, you better say 17. Say amen right there. I want to tell you something. First, maybe the second time I I said, Solomon, I want to get in that tomb early before anybody gets over here. But I got over there and there's somebody there. I said, well, you leave him out here. And I said, I want to get back there where his feet were placed. And I want to put my head where his head was uh, laid. And I, I, I want to fold my hands with my body. Same place where Jesus was there for three days. Solomon, I, I said, now, Solomon, that little iron gate there. Now, bless God, I want the keys. I don't have the key, Brother Mace. But he said, I'll tell you what, it's behind that first rock. 
<laughs> and I got to go out in the garden and do something, so I, I ain't going to be watching. I said, well, you need to be, because bless God, I'm going back there. Just as soon as he got out there in the garden, I reached up right behind that rock, got that key. I opened that little old iron gate. I went back there and took off my shoes. And I laid down and put my feet where his feet had been. Put my head where his head had been. Folded my hands over my body. And I said, Dear Jesus, I, I want you to let me feel a little bit of the same power that raised you from the dead. And I want to tell you, I got it. Bless God, I ran out. And there's a gang out there, a whole, uh, a whole group of people out there waiting to have a, a service. And I ran out and they thought the second resurrection taking place. Bless God. I tell you, I'm so glad to name that. You say, preacher, how can he do it? I want you to know Jesus has stepped out of the grave for our justification. Number four, number five, listen to me. He sat down as our intercessor. I'm glad of God. He sat down. Simon Peter said when he purged our sins, he sat down. Go with a God. I'm glad he's still there. But some golden daybreak, he's going to stand up and say, Father, it's time for me to go back. I've got a church waiting on me. I redeemed with my own blood. And brother, he's going to stand up. And then he's going to come back. And what a day that's going to be. Now watch this. The Bible said when he perched our sins, he sat down. My, my oldest grandson was with me. He goes over here to Stone Mountain Christian School. I don't know why a teacher would teach a boy this. I guess because he thought he could do it better than we adults. We are going to Mississippi and he said, Pappy, he said, I want to tell you something. He said, you know what was in that tabernacle? And I said, tabernacle? He said, yeah. I said, there are three courts in that tabernacle. <laughs> I said, really? He said, yes, sir. I said, how do you know that? He said, he said uh, I, I, my teacher at school told me said, you know the furniture in that tabernacle? And I said, no, not all. He started telling me about the furniture. And I said, did you know one piece of furniture is not in that tabernacle? He said, no, sir, I don't know. I said, you ask your teacher next time. Find out that one piece. I said, I'll tell you what it is. It's a chair. I said, our earthly priest down here never did finish his work. And he never could sit down. But I said, my heavenly priest, praise God, when he finished the work, he sat down. And then when I said that, you know what he said? He said, Pastor, you know what was on the, uh, the bottom of that priest, this garment down there within Trump Grants? I said, no, what was it, little Nolan? He said, it had some bells down there. He said, you know what those bells were for? And I said, no, what were they for? He said, when that priest went in by the Holy of Holies and made intercession or prayers, he said, he didn't say anything. He said, prayers for the Israelites. He said, the bell would ring when he'd move around and they'd know that the priest was alive. I said, son, that's exactly what happens when I get to praying. I said, the bells of heaven get the ring. I know that he ever lives. Yeah. Hebrews 7. Yeah. Praise yeah. God. To make intercession for us. Yeah. The Bible said he's able to say to the uttermost, all that come to God by Christ Jesus, seeing that he ever lives, to make intercession for us. My Bible said, little children, I write these things unto you, that you sin not. But if any man sins. We have an advocate with the Father, Christ the Lord. I'm glad tonight, my friend, you say, preacher, what authority did Jesus have? I want you to know he sat down at the right hand of the Father as my intercessor, my priest, and one that I can go to at any time, at any day, at any hour. I have a real friend up in Greensboro, North Carolina. He's one of the best lawyers. I guess in North Carolina, he's a criminal lawyer. You go to his office, he has the whole fourth floor in the First National Bank. He and his brother, Henderson, the Henderson Law Firm. To make a long story short, he's got a Learjet. You know what Learjets cost? Not under, not under a half a million, maybe a million dollars. And I was up there one day with old Worth, and I said, Worth, you've been my friend, you're a lawyer. He said, I want to tell you something, Mace. I haven't been able to be a friend like I'd like to be. But said, if you ever get in jail, if you ever get in trouble, and you need a lawyer, said, all you've got to do is pick up that phone call, 919, my number here in Greensboro. I'll jump on that rear jet and come anywhere in America to defend you. He said, I'll be your lawyer. I'll be your advocate. And I looked at him and tears came in my eyes. And I said, Worth, I appreciate that. But if I needed you, you might be sick. If I needed you, you might not be able to come. But I have one that's at the right hand of the Father. Like, Woo! 
praise God. He never slumbers. He never sleeps. I'm glad he's always on the line. And praise the Lord. I'm glad Jesus sat down for our intercession. Now last but not least, listen to me tonight. He could say, go and sin no more because he suffered and bled and died for you and me. I got that picture from Brother Preston Moore one time. I never will forget this. Or he called my wife up and said, Mr. Jack, don't you stand right there. My wife stood right about here. And Brother Moore said, Art Choir, I want you to look down at Miss Jackson and see that part of amazing grace through many dangerous calls and snares we've already come. There I was standing there. I thought they saying it about me. Her living with me on them dangerous tires and snows. And I thought, well, my preacher. And then about that time he said, you come down here, Brother Mason, stay with your wife. And I want the choir to sing to you and Miss Jackson through many dangerous toils and snares. We've already come. And then he said, I'll tell you what, I never had this church to do this. But before Brother Mace comes, I want every one of my men and women in that choir to get on your knees. And they all just fell down on their knees. And he said, Brother May, he said a night before last, that one of his favorite songs is, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was laid upon him. And he said before Brother May preaches, I want everyone on your knees to sing the healer. And boy, they got to singing on their knees. The tears got to coming down. And I want you to know when I thought about it, he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. He took my whipping. He suffered for my sin. I said, Lord, I want to love you. Lord, I don't want to be ashamed of you. Lord, I want to be what you had me to be. Lord, I want to go out and tell the world that Jesus came down from heaven, walked all the way to Calvary, took my place, suffered my death, died upon the cross for me. Thank God, Jesus Christ, he came in my stead. He came and died for me. I'm glad he came and died for you tonight. What a blessing. Let me give you this, and I'll close. I go up to West Virginia, and uh, West Virginia, they're great folk up there. I went back to a little one-room schoolhouse, and my good friend up there said, Preacher, you haven't seen one of these years. And I said, Brother, I've never seen one, tell you the truth. He said, Well, I went to school here. My daddy went to school here. We had all grades in one class. And I looked at that, and I said, Preacher, that's wonderful. Boy, them old schoolhouses didn't have much, but they had discipline. Boy, they taught you the three R's. And they, and they believed in what they were teaching. They taught them to respect the flags. That he wasn't worried about hippies. They wasn't worried about the junk of dope and all that stuff we're worried about today. That little one was left. He said, Preacher, you heard the story? And I said, Yes, sir. I know what you're going to tell. Tell me again. And I want to tell you quickly before I close. Said there was a young boy graduated from Morgantown, West Virginia. That's the University of West Virginia. And said he, he, he took education as his curriculum. And when he came back to this little town below Oceana, West Virginia, they said he came to that little schoolhouse and he had kids from five years old to twenty in one class. And he said those kids got, didn't like him being just out of school and they rebelled against his authority. And they'd shoot spit wads at him and they'd throw a, a reef back and get a racer and throw it at him and laugh when he'd lean over to pick it up. And after two weeks he said, I'm sorry that you do not respect me and I can't do you any good, boys and girls, and I'll leave you. I'm leaving after the day and I want you to know that I loved you and I tried to help you and you wouldn't let me help you. One old boy back there was touched by that and he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. His daddy owned everything in the county. Boy jumped up and said, wait a minute, where are you going? He said, if it ain't enough money, Papa will give you the money. And he said, son, it's not the money. He said, well, teacher, what would you do to stay here? I like you. And they like you. They just mean like me. And the teacher said, if you'd obey and respect me, I'd stay. I don't want to leave. I came here to help you. About that time, a boy jumped up and said, I'll tell you what we need to do. Pull that blackboard over a little closer. Write on there some rules, the penalty for breaking those rules. And he said, let us, let us put down what, what ought to happen when the rules are broken. The penalty. And he said, all right. He said, for being tardy. They said, stay in three times as long as you're tardy. He wrote down and stay in three times as long. 
He went on down. Finally took different little sins and uh, breaking of different rules. And he came down to stealing. He said, fix the lashes on your neck and back. And came right on down. Oh, right on down the list. And finally when he was through, he said, now will you obey the rules? And they said, yes. If we don't, the rest of us will see that the one that breaks the rule pays for it. You won't have to worry, teacher. Three days later, four days maybe, a boy got up and he was the same boy that they called him Big Jim. And he said, teacher, everybody kept all the rules except one. And the teacher said to have. I didn't know they'd broken any. They'd been mighty good for the last three days. Jim, he said, yeah, but I went back just a few minutes ago to get some water out there to well. And somebody stole my lunch. And that means fit the lashes on the naked back. And whoever it is, stand up. And a little ragged boy stood up. A little ragged boy held up his ragged sleeve. And he said, it's me, teacher. He said, you see, my daddy drinks. And I, we haven't had any food in my house for a month. And I ain't had a bite to eat in three days and three nights. And I came in this morning. I saw Jim's lunch. And I just had to get it. I, I was hungry. I couldn't sleep last night. I had to have something to eat this morning. And yes, I took it, teacher. And he walked down and took off that little ragged shirt and leaned over for the 50 licks on his neck and back. All the kids went to crying. They bowed their little heads to not look. And the teacher reached over and took that big old whip in his hand. Said, all right, son. I hate to do this, but that's the rules on the board. And he started up. And Jim jumped up and said, wait a minute. Wait a minute, read that rule over again, teacher. And the teacher said, what do you mean? It says fifth of license if you steal. That's just simple. He said, yeah, but it don't say who's to take the fifth of license. He said it was my lunch that he stole. And he said, you know, I've never been hungry. I've never, I don't know what it is to go to bed and cry because I don't have to eat. My daddy's always had plenty for me. He walked up there and he pushed that little boy aside and said, stand over our son. He said, let me take your licking for you. And he pulled off that nice sweater, pulled up that nice shirt, and he said, lay 50 lashes on my back. And the teacher said, all right. And he laid 50 lashes on his back. And when he was through, a little boy walked over and looked up at him and said, Big Jim, why did you do it? And he said, I guess because I loved you and I felt sorry for you. I want you to know that in Calvary, Jesus went yonder and took my with him. Suffered my death and I go to him tonight. And I say, why? And he said, because I love you. Oh, because I came to redeem you. I took your with him. I took your suffering. And he said, neither do I commit thee. Go and sin. Thank you for listening to the Classic Sermons podcast from PreachTheBible.org, a ministry of North Valley Baptist Church in Santa Clara, California. To listen to many more powerful sermons, visit our website, PreachTheBible.org. If you enjoy Christian music and programming, visit KNVBC.com for Christian music you can trust.